housekeeping item I want to mention is that we have all these proceedings being recorded uh, live and uh, uh, Portage Digital Network, and you can find that on YouTube and Facebook, the Portage Digital Network, if you want to uh, review any of the presentations. Okay, so welcome everyone. This is our 12th annual presentation of the Portage County Crisis Intervention Team Officer of the Year Award. The Mental Health and Recovery Board of Portage County is extremely proud to be associated with this uh, important and special program. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our board chair, Mr. Bill Nome, who is the chair of the Mental Health and Recovery Board. He'll be our MC for the recognition event. Also, Senator John Eklund has joined us, and Senator Eklund will be giving a presentation after the award ceremony, but he has also brought uh, proclamations for the officers. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Bill. Thank you, John. Welcome to the 12th annual presentation of the Portage County Crisis Intervention Team Officer of the Year Award. The Mental Health and Recovery Board of Portage County is extremely proud to be associated with this fine program. This afternoon, our, we want to wish a good afternoon to our honorees, family members, guests, my fellow board members and colleagues, it is the board's distinct honor to sponsor this award, and we look forward to doing this event every year. What is CIT? It is a philosophy and a set of tools adapted by safety person, safety forces, that helps them to work with people in crisis, many of those persons with mental illness and or addiction. The skills that law and safety professionals learn keep them and the persons with the mental illness safe in unpredictable situations. It means that the officer has taken extra time and care to become aware of mental health and addiction problems and then to learn and practice de-escalation. This also means the person experiencing the crisis will receive the appropriate care and avoiding arrest when possible. There are over 250 officers and other professionals now trained in Portage County since the Portage CIT program was established in 2006. Today we are honoring the work being done under the auspices of the National CIT program, which is overseen by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Here in Portage County, the board partners with Sheriff David Doak and the Portage County Sheriff's Office to coordinate the training every year. This year, the Portage County Police Chiefs Association reviewed the nominations and selected three officers to be recognized. I would like to invite Sheriff Doak to come up to the podium and make a few remarks. It is afternoon. Good afternoon. I see a lot of familiar faces out in the audience. For those of you who have not met, I'm Sheriff Dave Doak. Um, I have been involved with uh, the CIT program. I had an opportunity to go through this back in 2007, Seven. Seven, I believe. And I have to tell you, um, you can tell by this gray here, this is not my first real I've been doing this a while. But um, I, I have to tell you that I was really impressed with the training and the, um, the curriculum that went along with that. And especially in today's times when we were dealing with individuals um, who are suicidal, um, had mental issues, abuse problems, and what have you. And the de-escalation um, that you learned in this training um, has really been helpful to a lot of the officers. We've also put some correction staff through it, some dispatchers, um, and, and it's excellent training, and it's probably um, some of the best training I've had throughout my career. I also like to um, recognize the Mental Health Board 
and certainly a lot of my colleagues in the room. Um, I want to thank Street Grill PD who has provided the, um, a training room for us to continue the CIT program. Um, it, it's um, on behalf of, of law enforcement here in the county, the other chiefs um, collectively get together and we go over the um, um, folks uh, who are going to receive the awards, they, they submit a, um, a brief synopsis to us about what they have done and their accomplishments. So I am um, honored to be here today and congratulate those who are um, getting the award today and I thank all of you. Thank you, Sheriff. The first Officer of the Year recipient is Officer Diane Dudziak from Kent State Police. I welcome Captain uh, Chris Jenkins to come up here and tell us why she was nominated. Good afternoon. Um, Chris Jenkins, Captain with Kent State Police Services. Diane, congratulations. Mental Health Board, thank you. Mr. Nome, thank you. And Karen, wherever Karen's sitting in the room, thank you for the countless email exchanges. If this is my first ceremony in attendance, uh, I really appreciate your correspondence. Uh, Diane started with our agency in 2015, October, early October. So a belated congratulations on four years of service. Shortly thereafter, she received the CIT training that Sheriff Doak spoke about. Uh, Five-day training, very intensive and exhaustive that she made it through. Um, as did our other CIT award recipients. And I'd also like to extend congratulations to both Ravenna and Kent Police Department representatives here today. We're very proud of Diane and the service that she gives to our university community. Diane has a tireless drive. Uh, she makes me yawn and uh, get tired-eyed often. Uh, as I hope you don't after eating the fabulous lunch that we had today. <laughs> Diane has uh, unique life experiences that uh, I think afford her a different lens to look through these situations with. She earned her master's degree in forensic psychology. She uh, coaches soccer at the high school level. She also coaches for the Special Olympics. She speaks Mandarin, if anybody needs a translation. <laughs> and she can fix your washer and dryer if you need that over the winter. <laughs> Most of all, she has an extremely supportive network of friends and family, some of those that could be here today with us. Thank you for being here today to honor your daughter. As Diane approaches uh, persons in crisis, I think it's uh, noteworthy to mention her genuine compassion for this. Um, she doesn't approach it in, in the sense that we approach any other law enforcement type situation, much like the CIT training teaches you. Uh, she approaches individuals with a, a non-judgmental lens, with neutrality and genuine compassion. She has uh, recognized situational moments where reassurance and connection with community resources foregoes emergent hospitalization. She's de-escalated persons with significant paranoid delusions, one of which recently felt that uh, somebody was going to murder them and it was in the moment uh, intervention as she was able to reassure him and get him to a place, meet him where he was and get him to a place of, of reassurance and wellness. Uh, to recognizing the secondary effects of crisis on those surrounding the individual that's in crisis, the secondary individuals, <laughs> whether it be family or friends or bystanders, uh, she does all this, as I said, with the genuine compassion for the individuals, but also with the dignity and privacy for those involved. Uh, the culmination of, of, of her work in the past year was an underrepresented university student in crisis. Um, the person also suffered from a mental health illness, which with Diane's background, she was able to, to not diagnose, but be aware of the diagnosis. She offered an extreme amount of reassurance provided the community and county resources to this person for future needs, and also aided in the coordinated care of the person in the moment with the services that the person was all already receiving. So Diane, once again, on behalf of Chief Tom Bigley and I, I congratulate you, the other recipients, and thank you. Uh, 
Officer Nunziam, the Mental Health and Recovery Board of Portage County thanks you for your dedicated service and your commitment to the principles and values of Crisis Intervention Team. Today, October 30, 2019, we recognize you as the 2019 CIT Officer of the Year. So you have your award, and then uh, you have the proclamation from Senator Atlin. Thank you. Thank you. Next speech. If I don't have to, I have to. Oh, okay. Just, Just thank you. you. <laughs> Just thank you. The next officer of the year recipient is Officer Scott Krieger from Ravenna Police. I welcome Chief Wallace to step forward and say a few words about Officer Krieger. You know, I can never remember if I'm supposed to envision you guys in your underwear or I'm supposed to be in my underwear. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jeff Wallace, and I'm the police chief of the Ravenna Police Department. And I'd like to say a few words today. The role of law enforcement has changed greatly over the recent years, especially in the way we deal with people who struggle with mental illness and are in crisis. Police officers are equipped with what is called the warrior mindset. We are trained to deal with technical and tactical scenarios decisively. And we need that mindset because the job of a police officer is inherently dangerous. But because our role has changed over the years, we've had to expand our mindset, and develop our interpersonal skills, to learn how to be inclusive and to be better connected with the people in our community. Instead of always operating in the warrior mindset, we've begun to think holistically. The warrior mindset will always be there, but because we only need it five to 10% of the time, we often operate in what is called the guardian mindset. We see ourselves as guardians of the community instead of at war with it. Patrolman Scott Krieger is the, embodiment of a, is the embodiment of a guardian. Over the past year, Scott has gone above and beyond to help two people in our community who struggle with mental illness. To help these two people, Scott has spent hours personally reaching out to their caseworkers, representatives from Coleman, prosecutor's office, and judges in an attempt to resolve these issues better. <laughs> As a result, one of the people Scott helped was finally able to get into his, an assisted living facility and is no longer a threat to himself. Also, the police department's negative contact with the other subject has been greatly reduced to Scott's direct involvement. The mission of the Ravenna Police Department is to make our community a safe place to live, work, and visit. The daily impact Scott has on our community is a testament to his character and his commitment to that mission. It's an honor to be here today to see Scott receive this award. Congratulations, Scott. Thank you, Chief. Officer Krieger, the Mental Health and Recovery Board of Portage County thanks you for your dedicated service and your commitment to the principles and values of the Crisis Intervention Team. Today, October 30, 2019, we recognize you as a 2019 CIT Officer of the Year. Thank you. <laughs> the next officer of the year recipient is Officer Dominic Poe from the Kent Police Department. I would ask Captain Nick Shearer to come forward and say a few words about Officer Poe. Good afternoon. I'm Captain Nick Shear with the Kent Police Department. I serve as our Captain of Operations, where I oversee uniform patrol. Uh, as part of that, uh, obviously, that, that includes our crisis intervention team officers. Uh, I'd like to introduce Officer Dominic Poe. Uh, he's been selected for, to be our uh, crisis intervention team officer of the year for the Kent Police Department for uh, this year. 
Uh, Officer Post started with our department in 2007. Uh, a year later, after he was hired in 2008, he completed his CIT training. Uh, he successfully managed a variety of CIT calls this year and throughout his career. And he's been recognized by our department CIT coordinator uh, as the Officer of the Year. Uh, he exhibits a great deal of caring and compassion uh, for those who are in crisis and that possess the potential to harm themselves and others. Officer Poe can recognize these behaviors, neutralize the triggers, de-escalate the behavior, and convince those in a crisis uh, that they need to receive some additional assistance. He's learned to approach these types of calls with a calm demeanor uh, that disarms anyone who may distrust law enforcement. In reviewing the CIT reports for this year, I've also taken note that it is encounters encompass a wide variety of people in crisis uh, of all different ages. Uh, sometimes he has encountered people who have never been uh, involved in any type of counseling before, and sometimes he, he's uh, encountered people who have consistently been involved in counseling. Uh, through this, he's shown a knack for dealing with these different types of uh, situations and, and people effectively to achieve the same positive result. Uh, in addition to his presence on our crisis intervention team, Officer Poe has also been selected is one of five officers on our department uh, to be part of the Portage County Critical Incident Stress Management Team. Uh, that's a team comprised of officers and dispatchers throughout the county who provide uh, crisis intervention assistance to officers or, or other members of the law enforcement community as peer counselors when they encounter a crisis situation. Um, he's had specialized training in that and um, he himself was involved in a, in a critical incident in 2015. So he knows and understands the needs of officers and other members of law enforcement who are dealing with uh, situations like that. So in summary, Officer Poe is an invaluable member of our police department and clearly devoted to helping others in, in the year. This is evident in his response to various CIT calls, as well as his dedication to law enforcement members within the Portage County community. For those reasons, um, Proud to nominate and support Officer Poe to be the 2019 Crisis Intervention Team Officer. Thank you, Captain Shearer. Officer Poe, the Mental Health and Recovery Board of Portage County thanks you for your dedicated service and your commitment to the principles and values of the Crisis Intervention Team. Today, October 30, 2019, we recognize you as a 2019 CIT Officer of the Year. You're welcome to raise the mold. Say a few words if you want, Officer. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> This, this concludes the awards portion of this program. Congratulations, Officer Fetziak, Krieger, and Poe for your support of the CIT program and the residents of Portage County. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, before I uh, introduce Senator Eklund, I just want to also recognize our recovery outreach team. We, we have recovery outreach services here in Portage County. Uh, they are uh, peer recovery support specialists that work with Town Hall 2, uh, um, uh, Family and Community Services, and Coleman uh, Services. And they are certified peers uh, that reach out to individuals who have had an opioid overdose. They do this together with a first responder. Um, and so we've been doing that a couple of years now and we're expanding that. I just wanted to uh, recognize um, uh, Jim Bucks, Lieutenant Jim Bucks from uh, Streetsboro Fire has been one of our champions and we're also going to be uh, um, calling upon him to be a part-time uh, first responder uh, outreach coordinator for our county. Uh, he'll still be available to put out fires. Um, and then also Joe Folan, who is a peer recovery support specialist with uh, Town Hall 2. And could I ask all of our peer recovery support specialists that work with the recovery outreach team to please stand and be recognized for your work? There's, I've seen a couple, there we go.
Thank you. As I mentioned, they reach out to folks and try and engage them, and you know, just the possibility of hope and of treatment, and uh, and work with them on whatever level they may be. So next, I want to uh, introduce uh, Senator John Eklund. Uh, he is currently serving his second term as state senator for the 18th district, which, as we all know, comprises portions of uh, Geauga and Lake County, as well as all of Portage County. Senator Eklund's long and noted legal career in Northeast has allowed him to cultivate a valued understanding of several key issues that the General Assembly oversees. He is currently the chair of the Senate's Judiciary Committee, which reviews legislation affecting criminal, civil, and commercial law. So please welcome Senator Eklund. Thank you very much, and thank you all for allowing me to be with you today. Uh, I'm a lawyer and a legislator. And I sometimes stop and think, well, that's an opportunity to really do some good. Uh, presents lots of opportunities to be purposeful around uh, issues that affect us all. And then I come to something like this. And I quickly realize how some people must think what I do is completely purposeless compared to what all of you do every day without any value um, to address things that I'm telling you 90% of the people in Ohio don't even want to think about. And thank God they don't have to think about it. But you do and you put your hearts and your souls and your backs your brains to work on such attractable issues. Uh, it is most humbling, and if nobody has told you recently, thank you for everything that you do. And if there's ever anything that I can do in my purposeless <laughs> uh, to be of help to you, I hope you'll continue to reach out to me as you have uh, in the past. Uh, I've been asked to say a few words about uh, a bill that is pending in the Ohio legislature now. It's called Senate Bill 3. Uh, it, I, and I am the, uh, the principal sponsor of the bill. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but let me give you a little bit of background. Back a couple of years ago, there was an issue on the statewide ballot that would have put into the Ohio Constitution a wholesale change in the way uh, drug crimes were classified and uh, prosecuted. And there was much hoo-ha over that. Uh, many judges didn't like it, many uh, law enforcement people didn't like it. You maybe remember some of the uh, uh, TV commercials that the sheriffs around the state put out there. Uh, and there was a lot not to like about it. Uh, not the least of which was, it was putting what was essentially a statutory issue into the state's constitution. And this was a, a principal objection that many, uh, as I said, judges, academics, public officials found to be the wrong way of going about it. Because once something is in our constitution, as a general proposition, it's there. And if it needs to be tweaked, if it needs to be improved, if it needs to be changed to make it more efficacious, you got to go through the whole process of going out there and getting 500,000 signatures on a petition to put it into, uh, to put an issue on the ballot to change the Constitution. Very cumbersome, and in a world where especially things like uh, uh, drug addiction and drug abuse and the enforcement issues around it is moving at such lightning speed, you know, the idea of having to go back through that whole constitutional amendment process to make sure the provisions are working right uh, was a nightmare. Uh, that ballot issue was defeated uh, that year, and it did not become part of the Constitution. But there were those of us 
who thought that substantively there were a number of thoughtful ideas contained in that ballot issue, even though we might not have wanted them to go into the Constitution. And so around the state, there were prosecutors and some legislators who at first independently, but then eventually collectively, uh, got together and decided, well, if there were some good ideas there, and we didn't like it being in the Constitution, why don't we come up with a law, statute, uh, that can you take some of the good that was contained in that proposition and put it into law where it belongs. And that was largely the genesis of Senate Bill 3. That started about uh, a year and three months ago. And the bill was introduced this year and it's still pending in the Senate, but coming very close, I think, uh, to getting voted out of the Judiciary Committee and onto the floor of the Ohio Senate, where it will then go, hopefully, over to the Ohio House of Representatives. They will have their way with it and uh, and send it back to us and we'll either, we'll either agree on what should be in it or we won't. But it's a process and it's a long process. And if you think legislating is easy, you know, you folks deal with many of these issues day in and day out, as I said, and you're probably at some time or another uh, literally pulling out your hair at, at the magnitude of what it is that you're doing, right? And you might say to yourself, oh, what that H-E double hockey sticks uh, takes the legislature so long to pass a bill on an issue that's so preeminent, so immediate, and so harmful to our communities. Well, it's hard. And it was meant to be hard. And there are a lot of people who need to be heard from. Before I get into that, let me tell you generally what the bill proposes to do. And it's driven largely by the fact that I and other people think it should not be a crime in Ohio to be addicted to drugs. Now, essentially the bill takes low-level possession offenses, which heretofore could be charged and prosecuted as felony fours or felony fives, and reclassifies them as unclassified misdemeanors, is the legal term, which means for a violation, someone can be sentenced up to a year, uh, a, a year, one day short of a year in jail. At the same time, we take the larger amounts and it, and we treat those as felonies, three classes of felonies, but we're saying to law enforcement, you charge these as felonies, you charge the defendant with trafficking in drugs, is the word we use, trafficking, major trafficking or aggravated trafficking. You charge them with that felony, but under the current law, Law enforcement, the, actually the prosecutors, have to prove, even with those large amounts of drugs in the possession of somebody, that that person either intends to distribute them or is prepared to distribute them or is prepared to ship them or is shipping them, is doing something that looks like trafficking, okay? Under the bill, those larger amounts, if you're in possession of them, just being in possession of those larger amounts classifies you as a trafficker. In other words, the bill seeks to distinguish, not just in terms of degree of, of uh, penalty, but in how you go about proving someone is a trafficker versus somebody who is in possession, probably in order to feed their own habit, or at worst, to sell a little bit to their friends to finance their habit. For those people, we're going to have basically a presumption that you are a possessor only, and for the larger amounts, we're going to have a presumption that you are trafficking in drugs. And the penalties are going to remain to be severe for trafficking, as I think that they should be. Now, um, the important thing to remember is, and, and, and prosecutors are engaged in this conversation, and, and they make some very, very good points, and let's look at it. You know, prosecutors have to prosecute their cases, right? So we need to be mindful of their concerns. Law enforcement folks have to enforce the law, so we need to be sensitive to their concerns. Judges 
need to sit in judgment of these cases at some point in time, and so we need to be mindful of their concerns. Some have been concerned that, well, uh, you know, if, if these possession offenses are just low-level misdemeanors, and that's not a low-level misdemeanor, by the way, up to a year in jail, in my book, is not a low-level misdemeanor. Uh, but you put, make them unclassified misdemeanors, um, I don't have any leverage over this defendant, right, as a prosecutor. I can't say to him, you know, tell me what you know, and I'll plead you down to something else. So they're looking for some kind of leverage in the course of doing their job. And I understand it, but, but here's the point. If some, even if, under the bill, someone is in possession of these low amounts of dangerous drugs, if the prosecution can allege that the person was preparing to distribute them, had packaged them for distribution, had transported them for distribution, all the things they have to prove today anyway, you can turn that misdemeanor into the felony that the prosecutors want it to be. Now, that's not going to happen all the time, if I don't miss my guess, because as I said, I think most of these low-level possession situations are people who have drugs in their possession to feed their own habit, as opposed to maybe their spouse's habit, maybe their, God, we've seen their children's habits, right? Um, but we're trying to accommodate the concerns of the prosecutors, which are legitimate, by allowing them to take those low-level amounts and charge them as, as trafficking offenses, if there's evidence to suggest that that's exactly what was going on with the drug. It's a, I guess you call it a rebuttable presumption that these are just possession offenses. That's the main uh, feature of the bill, and there's been a lot of conversation around that. Uh, there are some very important and thoughtful and smart people. The Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court doesn't like calling these things uh, unclassified misdemeanors. No? Okay. Um, but that's the direction I think we need to go. And we need to go that way for this reason. What's a, why? Okay, why? Last year I sponsored Bill, Senate Bill 66, last General Assembly, which went a long way towards increasing opportunities for particularly drug offenders to take advantage of a pro program we have here in Ohio called Intervention in Lieu of Conviction, where the judge, if certain criteria are met, can take this person and charge them with a crime, take a guilty plea, and then put them into a program. And if they successfully complete the program, they never enter the plea, so there's no conviction on the record. That's a great program. The bill also expanded the availability of record sealing for drug offenders in particular. Uh, more classes of offenders and more classes of drug offenders. Which is another great thing, right? Sealing records so that people can go to a, uh, an employer and, and respond legally under the law when they're asked, have you ever been, you know, you ever had a felony? They can say, no, which can sometimes be a, an entryway to a job and reintegration into society as a, as a productive person. Well, that bill went into effect. And what we came to learn is, I didn't know this, there are, there are companies out there whose business is to, I'm gonna use this word, it's not a pejorative term, to troll court records, okay? And, and get grab information out of court records about criminal behavior, put it into a database, and then when an employer wants to do a background check on, an on a possible employee, they call these companies who run the name, spit out a report, and give it to the employer, okay? Now, when that report goes out, because they, they're generating this data, they're getting this data almost on a weekly basis, if you get a, a, a story about John Eklund has been uh, charged with a felony drug possession, okay, and I and I'm in this intervention in lieu of conviction, and I go into the program, I successfully complete it, I come out and I get my record sealed under Senate Bill 66. Well, that could be six months, a year later. All that time, my name associated with a felony is in that database, and I hate to tell you. State has some powers, but we don't have the power to tell private business people what to do with their 
with their property and what they should. And so we can seal all the records we want, but the record of a felony is still available to employers and continues to hold people in recovery, people who've gotten better, people who have successfully completed any number of different programs, and they can say all they want, but my record was sealed, but I completed it. Most employers don't do that. They look at that report from that company, and all they see is the scarlet letter, F, and that's enough to hold people back. So that's why it's important that we reclassify these, these offenses where we can as unclassified misdemeanors so that assuming these businesses are going to continue to do what they do and assuming that these individuals get into a, an intervention in lieu of conviction program or another diversion program that the bill uh, provides for and successfully completed, they want to get their lives back together, they want to get back on the right track, they need a job, they need a place to live, um, that the information that will be provided to the employer or to the housing person will say, misdemeanor, and maybe that's going to help make a difference. I think it will. I most assuredly think that it will. A couple of other highlights of the bill that you should be aware of. Um, oh, well, I, I better mention this. The judges are a little concerned about this, right, because they don't know what to do with these cases. You know, in, in the way things have operated in Ohio forever is, if you have a misdemeanor, you go to municipal court. You have a felony you go to the Court of Common Pleas, and they're concerned that this reclassification of some of these offenses is going to mess things up. Because frankly, a lot of courts, a lot of counties have developed drug courts, you may have heard that phrase, and they some of them operate in the, in the uh, Common Pleas Court, some of them operate in the Municipal Court. And they're, they're great things. And the perception is, well, we want these cases, whatever you call them, to go to the court that has the drug court. And we've come up with a notion in the bill that basically says that's exactly what you can do with the prosecutors, the, the, the municipal and county prosecutors in each jurisdiction can decide among themselves how to get these cases into the court where they can be most effectively dealt with. But that's, that's an aside. Uh, and I've run way over my time of 10 minutes, I think. But, uh, but I do want to mention this to you because I think it's important to you. There, is, there, is, uh, there are statutes in Ohio that provide for circumstances under which uh, people who pose a threat to themselves, you all know this, or to others, can be uh, brought before a court and the court can order an involuntary commitment of the individual uh, in order to get an evaluation, perhaps in order to determine the extent to which uh, they need further treatment for their drug addiction or whether they have a, a, a serious mental illness of some kind. Um, that process has not been perfect. And, and there are provisions in the bill which I, I would love to say is going to make the process perfect, but it's not. But it's going to improve it a lot, primarily by removing the existing requirement, which is before getting admitted to one of those programs, even if it's on the recommendation of a parent, somebody has to demonstrate to the court, and I think put up some of, their ability to pay for the stay in the facility. Um, that's not inexpensive, number one. <laughs> number two, whether it's expensive or it isn't, not everybody has that kind of dough. And, uh, and I think it's, it's the way things are right now kind of uh, does not make that service available to as many people as it can. So we're working on provisions that will ease those financial obligations of the individual or the family who's just trying to get their loved one someplace where they can be safe and they can be evaluated and they can be helped. So um, I have great optimism for the bill. Uh, I think it has broad support, but it is very, very difficult uh, when for, for legislators, many legislators, when your county prosecutor comes to the, to the Ohio Senate and says, I'm again, uh, that takes a little bit of uh, time to, uh, to, to, to address, right? And we're engaged with the prosecutors. We're not ignoring them. We're trying to make the bill better with their input. But uh, you may hear 
prosecutors. You may hear any number of different people who think this is a crummy idea. And uh, I don't think it is. I think there's a lot of people in Ohio, and I think there's a lot of people uh, in the legislature who don't think it's a bad idea either. So that's what we're doing uh, on that particular bill. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has about it. If you have any input or any thoughts about it uh, and you want to share them, uh, reach out to my Senate office or call me on my cell phone. It's 440-867-3860. And if I don't answer it, it's just because your name doesn't come up with it. There'll be a voicemail. Leave me a message, okay? And I'm very, very grateful again for everything you folks do. Uh, and I look out in the audience and there's, I see people smiling. I mean, <laughs> and you're still smiling. So God bless you all, and uh, God bless what you do. Thank you again for allowing me to.